I want to thank Amanda and uh, Stuart for asking me to give this presentation tonight. Um, the topic is chronic kidney disease. Depending on definitions used, about 10% of the adult population worldwide has chronic kidney disease. CKD is divided into five stages. Each stage is worse than the one before. Stage one is defined by family history or imaging alone before kidney function becomes abnormal. Stages two through five are defined by how impaired the kidney's ability is to filter the blood. Diabetes is the most common worldwide cause of chronic kidney disease, yet less than 50% of the time does imaging with any modality reveal any abnormality. So imaging doesn't play all that big a role in diagnosing chronic kidney disease. While kidney's filtration ability has enormous reserves so that only after filtration ability has become cut in half, do blood tests become abnormal enough to detect CKD? The blood creatinine and urea nitrogen are, remain, of course, the primary parameters that reflect the failing function of the kidney. Each early detection with the right treatment can slow kidney disease from getting worse, hoping to avoid dialysis and transplantation. One of the most easily recognized Images, though not the most common, of diseased kidneys of CKD patients are those with polycystic kidney disease. CKD is defined as evidence of structural or functional renal impairment for three or more months and progressive and irreversible affecting multiple metabolic and physiologic pathways as shown on this slide. In this brief presentation, I want to focus on several specific aspects of plant-based nutrition management of chronic kidney disease. Let's consider the impact of proteins on your body's daily acid load. Meat produces a greater dietary acid load than plant foods. Diets in developed societies are largely acid-producing because of the proportionately greater amount of animal pro pro source proteins which are acid-producing than plant source proteins which are lar largely base-producing. Protein derived from animal sources are composed of sulfur-containing amino acids, which, when oxidized, generate sulfate, a non-metabolizable anion that contributes to a higher total acid load. In CKD patients, low bicarbonate reflects primary metabolic acidosis and is considered to be a risk factor for mortality and CKD progression. A study of CKD patients showed an increase of bicarbonate levels by increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables in their diet. So let's consider another dietary difference between plant proteins and animal proteins. Historically, low protein diet as a therapeutic measure in chronic kidney disease was advocated for more than a century. By definition, low protein is 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. A normal protein diet is usually about 0.8 to 1.3, and a high protein diet is one point, greater than 1.3 grams per kilogram per day. The goal is balancing between maintaining nutritional status versus increasing risk of CKD. In clinical trials of low protein diets administered at a lower threshold of 0.6 grams of protein per day, deterioration of nutritional status has rarely ever been reported. A meta-study of low-protein diets reducing protein intake in patients with chronic kidney disease reduced the occurrence of renal death by 32% as compared with higher or unrestricted protein intake. But there's a growing evidence suggesting that the source of protein, plant versus animal, may be more important than the quantity of protein consumed. Research, uh, research has shown that a low-protein vegetarian diet is efficacious at both treating and slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease. In a meta-analysis of six studies, healthy, healthy dietary patterns high in fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains were consistently associated with lower mortality of end-stage renal disease among adults with CKD with a risk reduction of 30%. So let's consider the relationship between chronic kidney disease and AGE. Glycation is a metabolic process where sugars chemically combine with proteins. There are two categories, early advanced glycation end products, early, early and advanced glycation end products. That's what the word AGE is. The mechanism of early product formation has been well described with hemoglobin A1C as the best studied example. 
these early end products are reversible, but advanced ad uh, glycation end products are usually not reversible. There are more AGE in people with renal failure, especially affected by their diet, because AGEs are not cleared as well in renal failure, and many AGE-induced changes are not reversible. Collagen interlocking is one of those irreversible glycation changes that leads to stiffness of heart muscle impairing relaxation called diastolic dysfunction. Animal-derived foods that are high in fat and protein are generally AGE-rich and prone to new AGE formation during cooking. In contrast, carbohydrate-rich foods such as vegetables, fruits, and whole grains contain relatively few AGEs even after cooking. Adding dietary fiber was considered as a treatment for chronic renal failure more than 30 years ago when it was found to reduce plasma urea. We know that the micro, microbial metabolism of protein produces a number of metabolites that may be negatively affected, that may negatively affect the kidneys. IS and PCS are two such uremic toxins derived solely from the colonic bacterial fermentation of protein. Interestingly, it has been noted that vegetarians have lower levels of these nephrotoxic nephrotoxic compounds compared with omnivores in both healthy and CKD populations. Vegetarians tend to have higher fiber intakes, which could be, a metaboli which could be metabolized by the colonic bi microbiota instead of amino acids, leading to a reduction in these toxins. This provides another mechanism to explain why vegetarian protein sources appear less detrimental than animal protein sources. So, evidence has shown how vegans for reasons we've discussed, have less rapid reduction in GFR and lower risk of albuminuria than meat eaters. So we know the plant-based diets lend themselves well to low-protein diets suitable for CKD patients. In patients with chronic kidney disease, a diet with higher proportion of plant sources, 50%, has been associated with better outcomes. Constipation can lead to a higher retention of uremic toxins and hyperkalemia, whereas improved bowel regularity may enhance fluid loss and removal of nitrogenous products. The protein in a vegetarian diet is less fermentable, has higher fiber content, increasing peristalsis in the number of bowel movements, and is associated with less uremic toxin production, exposure, and absorption. So let's focus for a moment on phosphate elimination. Disturbances in mineral metabolism are common complications of chronic kidney disease, beginning at approximately CKD stages 3 and 4. The damaged kidney is unable to fully excrete a phosphorus load with early elevations of fibroblast growth factor, FGF23, in an attempt to increase urinary phosphorus excretion to maintain phosphorus balance, along with compensatory secondary hyperparathyroidism. Just to comment on the FGF23 that was discovered in the year 2000. It regulates blood phosphate levels. In CKD, recently it has been shown to rise before the PTH, blood phosphate, or dropping vitamin D. So it is a better screening test for renal bone disease than these others. Oral 125 vitamin D calcitriol is effective for treating renal bone disease. Very low protein diets are usually supplemented with deaminated keto acid analogs of essential amino acids. Naturally occurring amino acids contain nitrogen, which when metabolized yield nitro nitrogenous wastes that increase BUN and cause untoward effects on kidney function. Substituting non-nitrogen keto analog amino acids in tablet form can allow patients to realize the benefit of dietary protein while avoiding possible untoward effects of nitrogenous wastes. Furthermore, adding base producing plant proteins lowers levels of path pathogenic substances which induce the interstitial fibrosis that promotes nephropathy progression. Substituting soy and other legumes for red meat resulted in a reduced risk for end-stage renal disease by 50 to 60%. Despite relatively high levels of potassium in some fruits, yet vegetables and fruits can be used to treat chronic kidney disease without producing hyperkalemia. One, a one-year study of fruits and vegetables in the diet in individuals with stage 4 CKD was associated with lower than baseline urine indices of kidney injury. 
To date, indicate, the data indicate that fruits and vegetables improve metabolic acidosis and reduce kidney injury in stage 4 CKD without producing hyperkalemia. The treatment of pregnant women with CKD on moderately restricted low-protein diet is a safe management option and especially a vegan diet results in less need for protein restriction because during the pregnancy of a patient with CKD, the amount of protein in the diet must be balanced between the goal of diminishing hyperfiltration versus increasing metabolic needs of pregnancy. Due to the fact that pregnancy induces hyperfiltration, diets with restricted amount of protein should be beneficial in this age group in this group of patients. Vegan or vegetarian supplemented low protein diets in pregnant women with stage 3 to 5 CKD showed these three specific benefits. Plant-based diets also impact mineral metabolism issues of CKD because phosphate bioavailability from plant proteins is reduced. These effects lead to some benefits for chronic kidney disease patients. Finally, recent studies have demonstrated that modification of the di dietary pattern by reducing animal protein intake and increasing consumption of plant-based foods could influence cardiovascular risk, profile, and mortality rates. Thank you for your attention.